Welcome to another edition of Inside New Miami Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Henri Ford, Dean and Chief Academic Officer of the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Today, we are delighted to welcome to the studio Dr. Barry Eisenberg. Dr. Eisenberg is Professor of Medicine and the holder of the Michael S. Gordon Chair for, of, in Medical Education. He is also the director of the Gordon Center for Simulation and Innovation in Medical Education and the Senior Associate Dean for CME and for Research in Medical Education. Just a few items, a few titles that he holds because he's such a vital cog in the educational system of the middle school. But that's not all. Dr. Eisenberg has won numerous awards for his work in simulation in medical education, and he is president-elect of the Society for Simulation in Healthcare. Wow. Just so impressed with all your achievements when it comes to medical education, and we are clearly fortunate to have you on our faculty. So, but before we start, just tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got interested in medicine and then simulation and and to the point where you are today, this guru in uh, simulation and medical education at the middle school. Well, thank you, Dean Ford, uh, for that introduction. I think all those titles just reflect that I've been around a long time. Um, I really enjoy the podcast that you and your colleagues have, have done over the past several months, and I learned so much about my own colleagues that otherwise we don't have the opportunity in, in our day-to-day -day lives. So I, I was uh, one of the few faculty, I think, at the, at the middle school that was born and raised in South Florida. And growing up in the 70s and early 80s, um, two words you wouldn't necessarily associate with South Florida are technology and medicine. Um, but I first got interested in technology actually through my father, who owned and operated video game arcades throughout South Florida. And he would take me to the, the, the arcades, and I would work with him to fix video games, um, to fix jukeboxes and pool tables. And I became fascinated, not just on what you could do with these uh, amusement games, but really the technology behind them. About the late 1970s, early 80s, they became more and more computer-based or software-based. And I became a little bit adept at actually programming video games um, for my father and his colleagues, uh, particularly if they noticed that some of the, the young teenagers were getting too good at the games. They wanted to make it a little bit more difficult. And I learned how to actually go into the program and speed up the game. But that, that sparked my initial interest in actually technology. Well, fascinating. So um, that was the technology report. What, what about medicine? What, what triggered that interest? So I, I guess I, I really had nobody in my family that was a, a physician, but it was actually something related to my father. Um, when I was 15, he became ill um, and was unknown for about a year and a half. He started having some cognitive decline and some performance um, um, issues and disability. Um, it turned out he had a very large uh, cerebral meningioma, a brain tumor. And uh, th his experience through that, his operation, his long recovery, really um, infused in me a desire to want to serve others and to apply my love for technology and science into healthcare. Great. And so that led you to then go on to Emory and then pre-med and it just tell us a little bit about how you ended up in Miami. So, so the, the story behind that, again, related to my father's illness is that my mother, who before then was a stay-at-home mother, uh, she had to go back to work. And she, um, her previous volunteer work had been and related to development and in, in from large global charities of, of fundraising. And she answered an ad in, in the Miami Herald that there was a, a faculty member at the University of Miami uh, Dr. Michael Gordon, who was recruiting a development officer to help him raise funds for a new project that he was engaged in, in using simulation. And so as she joined Michael Gordon's laboratory in the mid-1980s, very quickly told me about this fascinating place where technology and robotics and computers and healthcare were all combined, and that just checked the box of everything that I was interested in. And actually, even before college, um, during summers and during holidays, I would volunteer and work behind the scenes in the simulation laboratory. So you started working then for this 
famous guy, Dr. Michael Gordon, back in high school. Back in high school, right. Tell us a little bit about that. You know, what was he like and uh, what made him so uh, impressive and, and someone you wanted to emulate? So um, one thing about Michael Gordon, very uh, passionate. And, and he had a, a very magnetic personality of getting people from different diverse backgrounds to be able to work together through his sheer um, enthusiasm and determination. When he told the story about how he got into uh, simulation, he was a cardiologist. He came down to uh, Miami when um, there wasn't really, our school was only about 12 years old. And he wanted to take the discipline of basic science and apply it to medical education. And he, he came up with this idea of developing a simulator that he called Harvey in honor of his mentor at Georgetown University, Dr. Proctor Harvey, and create a discipline of medical education much like we had a discipline in basic science and clinical science, that rather than leave it to chance of where students might see patients um, randomly in the clinical environment, you could program and standardize their experience through the Harvey simulator. And so that was way beyond my understanding when I first joined the laboratory. But I did have a certain skill that I was a musician. I played the piano. And one of the challenges they had early on is that all of Harvey's heart sounds and murmurs were on cassette tapes. They were four track cassette tapes that depending on where you listened on the chest, it would play a certain sound on that track. And because of my ear for music, because I was comfortable with technology, I actually recorded all of the cassette heart sounds for Harvey for about a hundred different simulators that were disseminated around the world. And so that was my introduction and indoctrination to simulation and working with Michael Warden. So now let, let's not understate your contributions to Harvey. Uh, he wasn't just recording. I understand uh, as a musician, a piano player, you had an integral part in that uh, in the final, I guess, construct. So tell us about that component. So that component was um, when I came back, I graduated from Emory undergraduate, came to the Miller School as a medical student between 1990 and 1995. There was an unfortunate event. I, I herniated a disc in my lower back and had to have surgery and decided to take a year off to work for a full year with Michael in his laboratory. And notice that the previous generation of Harvey was 700 pounds. It wasn't very portable. And I thought, well, how are we going to design the simulator to be able to be used more, more widely? And so I worked with, uh, with Michael and an engineer on scaling down Harvey from 700 pounds to about 50 pounds on developing new technology that would make it more affordable for schools and much more scalable so that it can be used throughout the entire curriculum as opposed to being just fixed in, in a cardiology suite or in our simulation lab. So all of that you did while trying to recover from this surgery. So you epitomize the concept of turning adversity into opportunity. That's a great lesson for all of our listeners and especially of our students. So over the course of that year, then you completely, I guess, I would not say miniaturized um, Harvey, but you made it far more portable. And tell us a little bit about what the landscape was at that time and and why that move was so critical to making it more adaptable and more acceptable in medical education. Yeah, that's, it's fascinating. The other complementary side of that was that as important it is to have a simulator, probably even more important is to have a curriculum to support it, to guide students. If you just have a simulator, it won't do anything by itself. You, it really comes down to the curriculum. I also took my experience of the first two years of medical school, in which most of it at that time was just sitting in a classroom for eight hours a day, listening to lecture after lecture after lecture. And I said that there has to be a better way. So also during that year, we developed one of the first multimedia curricula that took all of the lessons that you would normally passively learn in a lecture and put it into an interactive computer program. And so... Right around that time in the early 90s, the rest of the world was catching up to what Michael and some other early pioneers were doing in simulation and beginning to say, yes, this is something we want to do. We want to adopt it. But that the early prototypes were so expensive and so big, uh, they weren't going to be able to be disseminated. And so rather than coming up with new features, 
we really worked on the portability and scalability of the technology alongside with the curriculum. Is if we are going to have simulation adopted in medical schools and nursing schools, most of the deans at that time were not familiar with simulation, but the common language they all understood was curriculum. And so how could Harvey and other simulators address the needs that they were having at that time in their curricula? Great. So at that time, if I understand correctly, you were using Harvey primarily to teach the heart exam, but, but you saw the possibility of applying it to the entire body. Exactly. And, and not only just in the, the learning about the heart exam, one of the early studies we did during my year off was we integrated Harvey throughout the entire fourth year, four year curriculum at the University of Miami in four other medical schools. What does that mean? How, how did you do that? So initially, Harvey was being used just when you learned a cardiac exam. But we said, well, in, during first year, when you're learning about cardiac physiology and basic anatomy, if you could combine that lesson of learning about the aortic valve with listening to what the aortic valve sounds like when it closes, or when you're learning about basic cardiac physiology of when the left ventricle contracts and where left ventricle relaxes, and you combine that with the actual physical exam of where you put the stethoscope, it made it provided a context for learners who are otherwise learning very abstract concepts of physiology and pathophysiology, and it bring it to the patient so that they learn from first year medical school, why are we learning this physiology? Why are we learning this anatomy? Well, now we see a patient in the form of Harvey that, uh, that we're gonna apply these basic science principles to in clinical care. So we built upon learning the, the basic exam in the first year. When they learn about pathophysiology or different diseases, we expanded the curriculum in the second year. During third year, when they're, when they're on their clerkships, um, they would learn about patients or see patients with heart disease in the clinics or in the hospital. We'd have them come back and reinforce it um, with Harvey during their clerkships and actually begin to be tested on it. And then the fourth year, when they thought they might specialize in the pediatrics or in surgery or internal medicine, we added the more sophisticated diseases within Harvey uh, during the fourth year. Amazing. Amazing what you were able to accomplish during one year off. So I imagine this experience must have uh, triggered your desire to pursue simulation as a subspecialty after your training uh, in internal medicine. Well, it, it certainly played a role. I, I think when I when I graduated from University of Miami, I did my internal medicine residency at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, with the full intent of going into cardiology, of becoming an interventional cardiologist. And about halfway through my training, I could just get a sense of where simulation was going and made the, a tough decision. I remember at the, the end of my second year that I was going to pivot at that point and really dedicate my pursuit into simulation as a profession and for went, for went um, did not decide to go into, into cardiology. And it was actually reaching back out to Michael Gordon. At that time, uh, Dr. Lanny Gardner, who was the chairman of internal medicine, to allow me to come back early during my third year of internal medicine, complete my training at UM Jackson, and further um, get a head start on, on pursuing uh, simulation in medical education. Fascinating, fascinating. And, and clearly it has been a, a wonderful journey because now um, the hobby is what, available at a thousand institutions and it's being used in 70 countries uh, to train um, providers. So, so how does that feel? I mean, you, had, you, you played a pivotal role in that, and now you lead the Michael S. Gordon Center at the middle school. It's only when, when um, I'm on podcast or, or speaking to people like you that I stop and reflect as I keep thinking about the future. I, I'm not someone to kind of look back, and I, I really think about how much needs to be done. I think overall, not just within the Harvey Project, but the entire field of simulation to see what's gone on during the last 30 years, we've made tremendous strides on having the technology adopted, um, people being less skeptical about it, because whenever you develop a new innovation, whether it's simulation or now augmented reality, virtual reality, and even increasingly now uh, uh, artificial intelligence, there's always the proof of burden is on the new technology to demonstrate 
it's at least as good or better than the traditional way. And we did that with many rigorous studies of demonstrating that those trained with simulation could learn the material just as well or better than the traditional approach, but more importantly, could have an impact on patient outcomes. And probably that's been the most dramatic um, accomplishment is demonstrating really for the first time that the impact of education and training having on improving patient care. So what do you feel are the key milestones in the evolution of Harvey over the last 30 years that you've talked about uh, that have led to really its white scale worldwide uh, adaptation, uh, adoption? I, I think early on, because the Harvey Project, um, part of the team that worked with Michael Borden um, on developing the, the system, a major focus was on the curriculum. That has always been curriculum based. It's always been on developing competencies and less about the, the neat technology. And so the studies early on were from an educational point of view, how could this technology lead to better outcomes, better uh, problem solving, better psychomotor skills, better application of, uh, into patient care. And I think that the template of the studies that were carried out with Harvey were a model for the rest of the fields in, in simulation. And I think a project that, was, that, that spun out of the Harvey project is that in 1999 and 2000, the Gordon Center was approached by some international uh, experts in medical education who asked us to review the entire simulation literature on demonstrating what were the features of simulation that led to effective learning. Because most of the studies done in simulation before then were within the surgical field or anesthesia field or pediatrics. There's no, nobody did a, nobody did a holistic review of the entire field of simulation. And so our group, and I had the privilege of leading the group, looked at the entire literature base of, at that time, eight, about 800 studies. And we identified 10 key features that if you're going to use simulation, you incorporate these features in its application and it's going to lead to the best outcomes. And I think that review, we call it the BME review or best evidence medical education review, probably had as much or more of an impact on the wide scale adoption of simulation academically throughout the world than any other project that I'd been involved. What were some of the enduring findings from among those 10 uh, uh, attributes? So uh, being, being an experienced uh, expert educator yourself, these, they're not going to be surprising. Um, although they were to those who were really focused on the technology, but the number one feature is incorporating feedback. Any learner, when they're undergoing an educational intervention, have to provide feedback. They have to be guided on what they did well, but more importantly, how they could be improved. The other important feature was the opportunity for repetitive practice and deliberate practice. It couldn't just be a one-time shot at learning how to suture or learning how to intubate. Or, or learning how to listen to the art, you have to give opportunities for repetitive practice. And though those opportunities have to be determined by the learner. You set a high benchmark, which was another uh, key feature, and allow the learners the practice time to reach that benchmark. Traditionally, everything in education was time-based. You have an hour to practice and that's it. You have a half hour to practice or a week on the wards and that's it. Having an outcomes-based or competency-based approach, you allow the learner to determine the amount of practice. No wonder Michael Gordon Center has been so successful and now accounts for the training of 20,000 providers every year. Uh, that, that's simply remarkable, but I can understand how incorporating these principles of um, teaching, education, and retaining information have been so successful. So. Uh, 20,000 healthcare providers, you have medical students, paramedics, uh, firefighters, and, and instructors worldwide coming to you. Um, so so to, to tell me why is that important? And why is it important for both, say, the state and the federal government to support the kind of work that you're doing at the Gordon Center? It's very, very cool, Bernie. I think it's one of the things that makes the, the Gordon Center unique because almost every academic health system in the country, really throughout the world, has a simulation center. But I think one thing that has always made the Gordon Center unique 
is that it not only does direct training of up to 20,000 learners a year, but it, it, it comes back to curricula. We develop curricular systems and assessment systems that we then be, or disseminate to other institutions so that they can train their learners locally. So we use talented educational psychologists, engineers, uh, clinicians to develop curricula that we train the trainers, and then this curricula and simulation can be disseminated throughout the state of Florida. It's why we've been very fortunate of receiving funding from the Department of Education. They don't see the Gordon Center as a, a, a small center in Miami at a private institution, but really a statewide resource, so that when millions of Florida citizens call 911, those who respond have been trained with the simulation and curricular programs developed at the Gordon Center through its support. I think that recognition over time is extended to the federal government. And we've had a partnership with the U.S. Army for over 20 years where we train um, and provide resources for the U.S. Army Trauma Training Detachment, who have been headquartered at the Gordon Center for since uh, 2001. And they train forward surgical teams who are reservists in the military who come together for intensive training over two weeks before deployment. And I think it's the recognition that the skills they can get in this very intensive training can be obviously immediately applicable the next day. And, and that's a key, that's a key point because simulation being the underpinning of all the educational offerings, it's like you, you've done it already. You've been there. So it's no different from, um, I guess the the the, the pilots and having to do simulation training is that right? Uh, absolutely, and include a lot of the lessons that we um, have learned from aviation. We've applied to healthcare, and actually, it was through aviation that really uh, sparked Michael Gordon's idea of adopting Harvey. Uh, at the time when he was a cardiologist, he worked for the the FAA, approving pilots who had had heart disease, and they began telling him this is in the mid '60s about these flight simulators, and you got the idea, well, why can't we do this in medicine? And how is that um, changing our approach to training medical students throughout the entire continuum and also residents and fellows? So uh, some of the lessons in, in aviation was one about um, dealing with a pressure situation and the importance of checklist. Of Often we can memorize and we know what to do when all the conditions are well, but when there's a, a crisis situation, or emergency situation, it's normally for, for humans to freeze up or to panic. And the importance of having a checklist as your point of reference to go back and, and do a system check is very important. I think what we've also learned, very important in, in aviation, two more uh, concepts are the uh, teamwork, that we work together in teams, but we often train individually. But the importance of working together in teams and probably the most important lesson is in the importance of communication skills to each other, particularly when we do handoffs. Um, and so a big, a big part of what we focus on in simulation for medical students and residents and clinical providers are on fundamental communication skills to the patient, to the, your colleagues, uh, to the person who's receiving the patient. And so uh, at the University of Miami, on the first week of medical school, we have students working with both um, standardized patients who are actors who are simulating real patients on teaching them the fundamentals of important communication skills. So it's become the core fabric of for what we do. I mean, this, is, this is wonderful. It, now, as you look back, and you're the president-elect of the Society for Simulation in Healthcare. Um, what, where do you see the field uh, going? How does it evolve? You mentioned uh, augmented reality and AI. How are, the two, how are those tools going to apply? And how are you going to safeguard against some, some of the perils of uh, those important tools? I, I think it's, it's, uh, we're at a critical point of whether simulation is just going to continue being a, a new technology that has a primary impact on nursing schools and medical schools, because certainly it's been integrated and widely adopted at those levels. But we've just scratched the surface in terms of its adoption with health systems. Um, and the reason is that a lot of the models that we use simulation in nursing and medical schools and residency programs, very slow. It's very controlled um, because our curriculums are very controlled. We need to be much more nimble and more flexible if we're going to use simulation in a busy, time-pressured, 
efficiency-focused clinical environments. And that's where these new technologies such as artificial intelligence and augmented reality can, can assist us. In simulation, we collect large amounts of data on, uh, on, on performance. And it takes a huge amount of human resources to mine through that data on really focusing on what are those critical data points that are going to make an impact on patient care. And so oftentimes the lessons we learn take weeks or even months to be able to distill and be able to apply. Well, in the patient care environment, you need that information immediately. Um, it's the patient's lives at stake. There's large amounts of, of funding and efficiency of systems at stake. And I think the use of artificial intelligence will allow us to mine through that data, to weed out the noise and really focus on the signal that's going to allow us to deliver better outcomes and do things more efficiently. That's absolutely fantastic. The, the, uh, just to add up, the things we need to safeguard, of course, are the security of that data. And to make sure that if we're going to use tools like artificial intelligence, it comes with all sorts of potential biases that we do it and we study it effectively so that we don't apply the wrong lessons to the wrong types of people and make the same type of biases that may occur um, every day, that if we build them into AI, then rather being an isolated incidence of a bias or prejudice, we have the potential, if, we're, if it unchecked, to make it system-wide. We well, thank you for this very enlightening discussion. And and it's been a remarkable journey for you because you started with an interest in technology and education, and you were able to marry these two uh, into a career path, a career path that has taken you now to really the pinnacle of uh, simulation in healthcare as the president-elect. Uh, as you look forward, uh, tell us a little bit about how you envision bringing all your, all your experience into Project Ignite, which is the, uh, the future Miller Center for you know, Education and Innovation at the Miller School of Medicine, and, and what it means to you to be able to actually design uh, such a new clinical skills and simulation center for the future. Well, it's a, been a, a, a tremendous experience so far, uh, envisioning what, we, what is possible with Project Ignite. And I think if, if you step back and people say, what makes simulation different? Or how would you uh, describe simulation? Well, simulation br brings together three main areas that have been my passion for most of my life. And I think will really exemplify what Project Ignite all is all about. In simulation, it involves education and training. It involves innovation, technology. It involves healthcare. And I think those three elements will weave throughout the building that rather than those occurring in silos, Project Ignite will allow all those components to come together from the very beginning and be fully integrated throughout the entire building. So that when you walk into Project Ignite, you will understand that we're focusing on healthcare. You will understand that we're doing it through the delivery of education and training and the backbone of all of that will be innovative technology. Um, and so the, the, it, the largest component of Project Ignite will be the simulation and innovation. It's not just because I have an interest, I think it's the recognition that simulation allows so many possibilities in terms of how improving education and training, delivering healthcare, but also providing a test bed for, for prototyping new technologies that eventually will be applied to patient care. So that'll be the next generation RV. I'm not even gonna say RV 3.0 or 4.0, because by then who knows what it's gonna be. So that's fascinating. And, and thank you so very much for the insightful discussion. It's been quite enlightening. And I know that uh, the listeners to the podcast uh, have learned a whole lot from you. So um, this has been another episode of Inside Your Miami Medicine. Uh, with a very talented Barry Eisenberg, who has really taught, taught us quite a bit about uh, the underpinning of um, ed medical education, which is uh, simulation in healthcare right now, and where it's taking us to the future, and how exciting that field is, especially with the addition of augmented reality and AI. And we look forward to yet another session with you as the Project Ignite uh, continues to evolve. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.